So uh, um, I'm from uh, NASA Marshall. I run a T uh, project called uh, Impact. Um, and one of the things that we do is we look at uh, building advanced concepts uh, for earth science data, data systems, and information. So this talk is going to be about that. But before I get into that, I thought I'll show you an application. These are kind of things we want with our uh, NASA's Earth Science data. So this is uh, applying deep learning to estimate hurricane intensity. And the reason is if you, uh, the current intensity estimates are done manually, so they are subjective. And you can have estimates that vary, uh, you know, multiple magnitudes of order uh, from different forecasters. So we wanted to apply deep learning to this problem. And we've done this, and it's running operationally. Uh, it basically is running on the cloud. It waits for an event feed. And once that event is triggered, uh, it starts generating these results. Um, an example here is uh, we can look at, uh, if I can click. Oh. Uh, somehow I can't use the map. So, sorry, I can't, sh somehow it's not working. You can actually click and you can see the image and you can go through the time history. And the interesting part about it is not only you're getting an objective measure of the hurricane intensity, you're also getting now a forecast within 15 minutes. The official forecast is done in six hours. So you're having a time improvement and we can actually do it every five minutes if you want to. And this thing can be applied globally, not just around U US, so it can be applied globally to different developing countries where they don't have the capability. So this is just an example of things that we can do with our earth science data. So now I'm gonna switch. Okay, so now I'll talk about our uh, data and information system. Um, you may, end up knowing way more than you ever wanted to about uh, Earth science data and our uh, NASA's data information system. I have my presentation in three parts. One is to talk about the overview of the program project and the details of operations of what we do. Um, I thought I'll talk a little bit about metadata, but it's very much focused uh, from a data discovery point of view. And then the notion of data use, like looking at analytics and cloud infrastructure uh, towards the future where we are going. So uh, most people don't realize that earth science is a key component within NASA's portfolio. Uh, we have observations that are me taking measurements of the earth as a system, and it's to further science, and it's also to further societal applications. Um, the earth science data systems program is, is, is basically tasked to manage the earth science uh, data that comes from different assets that we have and developing data systems capabilities to support rigorous science investigations. Um, the, the processing of the data is part of the mandate there and also enforcing policy, NASA policy, which is uh, full and open access to data for everyone. The, the project is managed out of Goddard. Uh, the project called SDIS and the system is called USDIS, so sometimes you get really confused by the acronyms. So at a really high level view, this is kind of what the system does. You get data from different assets, uh, from satellites. Uh, once they reach the ground station, uh, it's captured, cleaned. It goes through this uh, uh, science processing where the, the actual instrument measurements are converted into science parameters using science algorithms led by science teams. Then it goes to archives for distribution uh, to different end users. So drilling down into a little bit more detail, there are three components to uh, this whole architecture. There is a, a, a component called SIPs, which are the science investigator-led processing systems. They are related to the science teams that are leading the, the satellite missions. So they know the science problems they're trying to solve. They develop the science algorithms that become the standard algorithms that are shared uh, that are used to create the standard data products that are shared with the science community to do their research. They are kind of the gold standard for scientific research. Then we have the DACs, which are the distributed active archive systems. 
The data, once it's processed, is sent to the DAX for them to do data curation, data preservation, and data distribution. And the DAX work really closely with the community uh, so that they can help them uh, deal with the com complex science data sets that we have. And we have these core services, which are our enterprise level services that we provide for searching, browsing the data. Um, so it is a complicated uh, system. I mean, we have uh, the DACs are distributed. There are 12 different DACs. There are more than that for the SIPs. They are distributed all over the country. They are assigned based on discipline um, expertise. So different uh, areas are selected where they have scientists with that expertise that can help within that particular discipline. Um, the data itself, as I mentioned, we are collecting uh, different measurements to observe Earth as a system. So we have measurements that uh, look at different aspects of, of the Earth. We have measurements looking at land. We have measurements looking at the ocean. We have measurements looking at the entire at atmosphere. Uh, we have cryosphere, which is a major component. And we also look at human dimensions. Uh, this is the data you can get from uh, Columbia University, where you get you know, population dynamics, that kind of data set. Um, the data is really heterogeneous. We get data from multiple types of sensors. Uh, these can be satellite uh, on-orbit sensors. We have instruments on the space station. We get data from uh, those instruments. We have airborne missions that are on uh, planes or they are on UAV, uh, UAVs. We have field data from field campaigns, which, which tend to be in, in situ measurements. Uh, we get data from people who are developing applications. And we also have special uh, programs that are filling the con continuity of the data sets. An example would be if you're doing uh, temperature, we have a new instrument launched to measure temperature. We want to make sure that, that that new temperature product is consistent with the older temperature product if you're trying to do long-term analysis. So there are all these programs, all these different data sets. So these are a little bit more complicated than you know, your normal trivial uh, data that you think uh, that people have to deal with. Um, this is the Earth Science Data and Information Policy. We are really proud that since 1990, we've been uh, uh, following this open and full sharing policy. Uh, we, there is no period of exclusive access. So it's not that the PI get a year's a year's worth of time with the data. The data is made available immediately as soon as it's, uh, it reaches the data systems. We make available all the source code, the coefficients, the ancillary data sets that is used to pr produce these standard products um, for reproducibility. Uh, there is non-discriminatory data access. We don't distinguish if you are Google Earth Engine want to grab our entire archive or if you are a PI at University of Idaho with one grad student. We treat everyone the same. Um, we, our mandate is to make sure we preserve the data. These are obviously high investments to send up the satellites in the orbit to make these uh, high quality measurements. We want to make sure that it's preserved so you can be used for research in the long term. We work with multiple agencies, not just NOAA, USGS, but we also work with ESA and JAXA in sharing data uh, or using data from different instruments. We try to be uh, metrics driven. So we collect metrics on our data systems to see how well we're doing to help evolve the data systems here. Um, so the SIPs, the role the SIPs play is they're, they're, they're tasked on what we call forward processing. So once you get the data, uh, they take the science algorithms and generate the standard products, and they can they produce products at different levels. So level zero is the raw product. Level one is where they've done calibration. Level two and three, they have done additional transformation. Level three is kind of the data set that general public can use because it's been gridded or put into some uh, reprojection or some parameter that's easy to use. They've, they've done some calculations. So there are different levels of data products that can be created from starting from the raw data set. Um, the, the SIPS then provides the data to the DAX. One of the key components, uh, the key tasks the SIPS will do is also produce uh, data in near real time. And I'll talk about that in a bit. 
Um, from time to time, they have to go back and reprocess all the data because algorithms change. They find errors in calibration, then they have to go back and reprocess the data, and that version has to be maintained in the entire pipeline. Um, they also do the documentation and help with the long-term preservation. Um, so the DAX, uh, you know, their key role here is to, uh, with, is data stewardship and preservation and archive. They also work with the community, so they are tied in very much to the discipline community, and they work with those experts to make sure that they can use the data set for the science investigations. So we do follow a very formal process of uh, ingest archive. Uh, it starts right up front when the mission planning starts. Uh, we, f we have to do uh, data management plans, uh, work, you know, create uh, inter-project agreements to make sure that everyone knows what is to be produced and how, to, to how it is to be produced and everything like that. Then we have a process of ingestion, which is requiring the data all the way from SIPs all the way to the DAC. It's a very well-defined process that we have. Uh, we have specifications for preservation that, of the data, uh, the description of the data to ensure that it can be discovered. Uh, metadata plays a, re a really key part for this. Uh, documentation for usability, um, and then the distribution, we provide multiple ways of accessing the data through APIs or downloads. And then end user support uh, for different kinds of users from university to other agencies. Um, not every data set is treated the same. We have this notion of level of service. Uh, there is a core level of service that we provide for all our Na NASA Earth Science data systems, but some get higher, higher level. Uh, it, would, it depends on the importance of the mission and obviously the budget, right? The more money you have, you can provide additional capabilities on it. Um, Preservation is really important for us because of these uh, you know, high value uh, data sets that we've collected. Uh, it is not just about preserving the bits from one medium to the other, it's making sure that we can do, uh, we can go back and understand the data set, we can use the data set, we can read the data set, we can reproduce some of the things that we've created before. So these are important things that we have to look at. Um, there is a specification document for preservation that we follow, so it is not just the data that you have to preserve, you have to preserve all the documentation that goes along with it. You have to uh, 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 save all the instrument calibration information, which is key. Um, the science software, a lot of the ancillary data sets that are used, um, uh, validation data products to check the science standard products that are produced, uh, and then obviously the reader software tools that go with it. This is one way of looking at the core services, the enterprise level services that we have within our uh, system right now. At the bottom you have the data holdings. There are different APIs for accessing. Uh, in the middle you have open service APIs for doing catalog searches, uh, and there is a browser imagery service that you can look at. And then you have clients for searching the data set or uh, visualizing the data set through Worldview. Um, the catalog that we have developed is called CMR. It's a common metadata repository. Uh, one of the things that we have to deal with is there are so many standards. So one thing that we came up with was this unified metadata model, which is what we use to store all our metadata, and then we can translate to different flavors of standards that people need uh, for their clients. Um, the catalog has been designed to do sub-second searches. So we have about 400 million granules that you can do sub-second searches and find granules that you need. Um, you can search for the data. Um, so this is basically the uh, Earth data search. If you're searching based on text and keywords, you can use this to find the data set that you want. All the data set is available online for you to download. Um, we have, I talked about Gibbs, which is the backend image, uh, browser image service. There is Worldview client that, talk, uh, that connects to this backend service, and you can actually browse all the satellite data that we have in, uh, in near real time. And all the software is available uh, free and open source. Um, 
we do produce uh, near real-time data products. This is done to support the application science community, uh, things like disaster support. So they need data in, in as, 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 as quickly as possible. So there's a three-hour window where we actually can produce the science data products that we can push out to different application communities. Uh, and you can find it uh, within our system. Uh, there are some data analysis tools, but these are very specific to the data centers, to the communities that they serve. Uh, so the ex two examples here is a, a LP DAC, which is a land processes. They have a tool called Appears that allows you to subset parts of la uh, Landsat data. And Goddard has a tool called Giovanni, which allows you to do some uh, uh, exploratory analysis of some of the uh, Mera data sets there. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I think this is also really important is uh, providing user support because we have data for, at different resolutions from different sources, different levels of complex complexity. We, have, we provide user support to our, all our end users, ranging from grad students to PIs to other agencies on helping them how to use our data effectively and correctly. I think that's key for us. Um, so here are the numbers in uh, end of 2018. We have about 27 petabytes of data in our archive. Uh, we have distributed about 1.6 billion uh, uh, products all over the world. We have uh, uh, more than 300,000 registered users worldwide. Um, we have 33,000 data collections, which are aggregations uh, within, the, within our archive, and about close to 400 million data granules. Um, so that's kind of a high-level overview of the program project and kind of the operations that you do. I hope it gives you a sense of, you know, what we have to do in terms of serving our community uh, with, with this data set. I want to talk a little bit about metadata. I think this is the, one of the sessions that uh, was asked to present. One of the things that we found is uh, we looked at our metadata for a while that there are two kinds of users, what we call local users and global users. And local users for us are people who are close to the domain, are related to the science team. They know the data well. They know the keywords well. They know how to find things really easily. Uh, you have, we also have global users who are the unintended users of the data set, right? We have data sets that were designed for a science mission but the data can be used for multiple different applications that we never thought about. And then we get all these users trying to find the data set. And we, we have not done a good job in helping these global users find the data and use the data effectively. So one thing that happens is we have all the local users go straight to the data DAX, and they can find the data set. The global users go to the uh, aggregated, the federated catalog, to search for their data sets. And if the data quality is not good enough, they have a really hard time finding it and understanding the data. So no matter how much we talk about making it, uh, uh, we can have best schemas in the world, we can have best uh, search tools in the world. If the content of your metadata is crap, you will not be able to do anything with it. I mean, it, it is the most Fundamental thing, we have data sets that have not been used because they've been, the metadata has been so badly written. Um, so one of the things, and this is a really good example, um, people searching uh, for something called NDVI, this normalized, uh, normalized Data Vegetation Index. It's used by a land use community all the time for applications, for applications. Um, but the data set, the modus, which has this parameter is not tagged with it, so the end user can never find this data set. So it's a waste of a resource that was collected and produced, and, and people cannot find and utilize it effectively. So one of the key things we looked at well, last year was to uh, put together a team and build a metadata quality framework, go through the catalog, and figure out a way to do the systematically, check quality of metadata systematically. And they came up with this framework where they are manually looking at stuff, but they are trying to automate everything that is repeatable. If they're finding an error that's repeatable, they're basically uh, putting automated checks. So this goes beyond just doing schema checks to validate against schema. This is actually looking at the content. Um, and they come up with this priority matrix of flagging uh, different metadata records. I think the red is the highest priority that people really can't even access this data set. Um, and here are some metrics. I mean, 
biggest issue, URLs. They have you know, no URLs or they have incorrect URLs pointing to the wrong thing. So there are all these inconsistencies that has, has to be fi fixed. Um, DOIs and collections, these are kind of relatively new in terms of what we added. So the data producers have had issues trying to uh, provide correct information. And the um, data format, I think earlier people really didn't care about data format when the users were just the science team members because they knew HDF or NetCDF. But now we are having um, large, cloud, large companies wanting to download data at, at you know, complete in bulk, bulk rates. They want access to all that information so their download systems can work. The, they need all this information, what format it is, so their systems can download and pre-process the data. Um, the last thing is abstracts. Um, and this is important because one of the things we want to look at is automating uh, using deep learning or AI techniques, this whole metadata issue. Can we do better job in tagging uh, titles, descriptions? So a lot of it can be driven by high quality metadata as your training data. So the team has made significant progress. It's definitely reduced a large number of metadata uh, issues for us, and it's still ongoing. So I think one key takeaway, take at least on the metadata that I'd like to point out is this, we should not have this mentality that we do it once and then we forget about it. It changes over time because we are adding new data sets. We have the taxonomy that we use changes over time. The application areas of a data set may change over time. So as a data steward, you have to go back and ensure that you are looking at the data set and making sure that it is representative. Uh, um, so the last thing I want to talk about is about data use, the cloud infrastructure and analytics. So like I mentioned, you know, the, our current architecture is something like this. We have different DACs, the layer in the middle. Um, so we, they tend to replicate their entire infrastructure in terms of hardware, software, and they also get, tend to get really siloed. You know, they are holding data sets for their particular domain. And science is getting more and more interdisciplinary. You need data from multiple, multiple different disciplines within earth science. So we need to figure out a way to do this better. Um, the other major driver that we have is we have all these new missions coming up till 2023. And some of these missions are high volume, high data rate missions. They're really going to change the amounts of archives. In fact, if you look at our projections, we are going to go you know, close to 100 petabytes, um, and we have this exponential growth that we have to deal with. We need a solution, and we can't keep building infrastructures over and over again at different locations. So the, the solution that we are looking at or moving towards is this cloud-based solution that we move and co-locate all the data in the cloud, in a com commercial public cloud, and we develop common in, uh, software infrastructure to do the ingest archive process and we still maintain the DACs for the discipline expertise, but they're leveraging the same components to do the same, same process. So we are minimizing redundancy in terms of both hardware and the software that we need to do. And what it enables is that now you can have people who can come to the data with the compute co-located to the cloud and do different kind of things. Kind of do the application that I showed you. The one that I showed you was running on the cloud. It's a pipeline that's running, you know, and on the data stream that's coming in. Um, it is, technically this is not that difficult to do, but moving, changing directions, especially within an agency, is a big cultural shift. And there are so many issues that we have to deal with, just the business process of how do you, you know, budget all these things, and there are so many issues that we have to figure out to get this operational. So the goal would be that we get uh, data close to compute. Now we can allow people to do processing to the data, uh, enable analytics, different kinds of analytics that we could not do at scale because of the way our existing architecture was. And then also enable community to come and develop applications on the data. You know, it should not be limited to uh, you know, the few people. It should be opened up as much as possible. I think that's one of the key things we want to do is open up to people, different companies to come and develop because uh, they will have access to the data, they'll have access to APIs, they should be able to uh, 
uh, build new tools to enable science, enable applications. So we built something called Cumulus, which is our ingest archive. Uh, it's a lightweight cloud native framework to do ingest archive for our NASA engineered processes. It's lightweight in the sense we've tried to minimize the code base to reduce our operational costs uh, down the road. And it's cloud native uh, because we wanted to optimize the cost. Everything that you design on the cloud has to be cloud cost optimized. So we went uh, cloud native, even though it ties us to a particular vendor, but that's okay, we wanna minimize our costs uh, right now. Um, it's, if you look at Cumulus, it's nothing but just a workflow system the orchestration engine is the AWS step function. Uh, you can define a workflow uh, which has steps, and each step can be a container which is invoked. And there's a dashboard for the operator to create these workflows and run our entire ingest archive processes for us. So this is what we hope the future would look like, where we have this Cumulus, different instances of Cumulus running on this cloud. Um, you know, with different workflows. The data can then be stored on S3 or Glacier, depending on the, the, the demand for the data set. Um, there is a container repository for the processing steps that can be shared across the community, and the code base is also open and shared, so people can come and improve this workflow system as they need. And then people can build new applications on top of the, the data storage that exists. Um, so with this strategy in place, we started looking at how do we enable analytics on the cloud. Uh, we had a workshop uh, la early last year uh, which looked at this, you know, the intersection of cloud computing, big data. Um, and one of the key things came out of it was this notion of analytics optimized data store. And what it is is like how do you, because of our complex data set, how do we pre-process data to minimize data wrangling, and also how do we put it in efficient storage structures to enable iterative queries. And I'm not gonna go into detail because I've run out of time, but the whole vision is this, that we can get up till, we can get up till here, where we have the archive data on the cloud, but we need to develop this layer to do this ETL, kind of like a data mart to a data warehouse and generate these ephemeral analytics optimized stores that can be built for supporting very specific science missions or problems that can be spun up and down. And then you can have different tools connecting to it. And there are different technologies and you, know, you can select whichever technology you wanna use for your, uh, your AODS. So I'm going to stop there because I've run out of time. I had some examples of some of the other things we were uh, examples of how you can uh, interactively work with data and find interesting things within the data. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because I'm running out of time. Thank you so much. Yeah, hi, thanks for your presentation. My question is regarding what particular strategy you've used to minimize your costs of using cloud. Is there any particular things you do in your workflow that are financially motivated? So um, we went as an agency, so we, I guess I can say this, we went as an agency and negotiated rates with Amazon. So they gave us deep discounts on existing rates. So that made it, uh, obviously, that was the first step, right? In the design process, we want to minimize things. Uh, we are using That's Lambda functions where possible design. rather than having EC2 instances running for a long time. So that goes into the design of the software it's, itself. The other big thing that we have to deal with is because we are distributing the data to everyone, we have to figure out a solution for egress. We cannot have unbounded egress. Uh, because egress, there's a cost cost to it. So they have developed these technologies that will throttle the egress if it reaches a certain point. And we are still providing the same amount of service, but we can throttle it to uh, cap our costs. So there are solutions in place to address that. Um, another question, it's sort of interesting that the original 
sort of um, study of merit, the Magellan study, came out of NASA in 2011 and essentially said, if I understand right, that the cloud at that time was appropriate only for embarrassingly parallel work. Mm -hmm. what, what has changed since then, in, in a nutshell? So I think a lot of it is our future missions in terms of storage costs that we have to deal with, right? The new missions, the NISAR and the SWAT missions, the rates are such that it's much more than what we've ever anticipated before. So we have to deal with the volume and the data rates. Um, most of the stuff we do in terms of processing can be done in more in a batch mode, like pleasingly parallel, right? We really don't have the driver for again, MPI-based computations uh, as a simulation would. So it's more, our, is, our focus is more on data processing and analysis. Uh, so I think that may be the case there. 